So just to start, each of our speakers will just give a really short uh, introduction for themselves, what they're doing, and especially how these questions we are dealing with today actually affected their, um, their positions today. Uh, shall we start with you, Musa? Sure. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm very excited. Um, so my name is Nusha Basiri. I am a partner at Hamadou and Fennenberg. Uh, we call ourselves a boutique law firm um, with, uh, with a headquarters, I would say, in Brussels. We have one office in uh, Singapore, but it was unmanned. And um, my, um, yeah, to, to give you just also a little bit of the background of where I'm from. So I am a, I'm a German qualified lawyer. I uh, grew up mainly in uh, Cologne, um, but I'm also Iranian by descent. So I lived also a couple of years in Tehran. And I do believe that the back and forth between um, Iran and Germany and then later on in my studies, uh, I studied in Barcelona and, um, uh, and also then later on when I did an internship in New York, etc., it helped uh, me and it helped my uh, path through international arbitration because uh, it does, um, I think, um, enhance the understanding of, of different cultures and not only legal cultures. And um, on the topic of today, I am... Um, uh, I think it's a very important topic. It's not a light topic. It sounds like a light, soft topic, but it's a very important one because it affects every one of us, not only of you, but of us because um, uh, now in my own role, I'm hiring a lot. I'm part of, of the team also recruiting um, interns or associates. And I um, also at the same time, I like to train a lot. So. Um, it's very important, I think, for um, young, the young generation to know very early on already where they see their vision um, guiding them and their career. And it can be anything and anywhere, but um, I think um, for that purpose um, already this topic of today and the discussions that we will have with my very esteemed colleagues here who have all very interesting backgrounds as well um, and uh, they, uh, their curriculum speak all for themselves uh, is, uh, is a very well chosen one, I would say. Thank you. Philip? Thank you, Padon. Thank you, Maria Claudia, for inviting me on the panel. I'm delighted to be here as well. So, my name is uh, Philip Wada. I'm an associate at uh, Wake and Case at the Paris office. I do um, mostly construction and energy arbitration with a touch of real estate. Um, and, and I have been a wedding case for about uh, five or six years now. I went to wedding case directly after doing my LLM here at Cambridge. Um, uh, and I must say, I'm, I'm delighted to be back. It's, it's good to see the faculty and, um, and these buildings where we spent uh, a lot of time and then a lot of late nights. Um, so on this topic, uh, I echo what uh, Nusha just said. It's uh, it's very important in arbitration. There's just so many conferences out there. Uh, it is important to get your your name out there. But one of the challenges, and this is something we'll discuss all of us um, more tonight, is uh, finding the time, especially when you start as a, as a junior associate. Um, there's a lot of work uh, to be done on the cases, on the complex cases taking a lot of hours, um, so then how do you find the time to, uh, to go to conferences and, um, and get your name out? Uh, that's certainly a big challenge, but it is important. Um, and with that, I think I'll... Thank you. Thank you, and thank you also from my side for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Sarah Gans. I'm a counsel at Wilma Hale in the London office. We specialize in international arbitration. Um, I'm a dual qualified lawyer, I'm qualified in Germany as well as in England and Wales. And in terms of the cases that I'm working on, it's um, both, they concern both as common uh, law jurisdictions and civil law jurisdictions, and a wide range of industries, energy, oil and gas, um, technology, pharmaceuticals. Um, I'm also on a member of the executive board of ICDR and i which is the Young International Group of the International Center for Dispute Resolution. 
And I'm also a regional representative of the DIS 40 in London, which is the below 40 group of the German Arbitration Institute. Um, also, maybe a bit of background um, for me. Um, I studied in Germany and France uh, before doing the masters at uh, the other place. <laughs> um, and I, um, I then did an internship at Wilma Hale in, in London in the International Arbitration Group as part of my uh, legal training in Germany. And that's how I actually then got into um, international arbitration. How you know arbitration network and the topics um, that we're going to discuss tonight, how they were relevant for me, um, I can say you know in, in many respects. I mean I think it's it's an extremely interesting topic uh, because the arbitration community it is it is growing, but it is still relatively small. So I think you know this this sort of network or or community sense, if, if, if you will, um, is particularly important in, in that field. Um, maybe one aspect to mention is, you know, I, I said that I'm, I'm an active member in these two organizations, and that has been quite important for me, because it has meant that I have become, you know, actively involved in the community, and it has helped me to, to grow my network, um, both within these institutions, or this organ these organizations, and and also through then organizing events and, and participating in, in them. But there, there are many aspects that we're going to cover also in, in the course of this discussion tonight. My name is Uzi Chan, and I'm delighted to be here with you all. And my thanks also to Marie Claudia and Fred for inviting me here. And I'm incredibly humbled to share the floor with these esteemed colleagues. I'm a mid-level associate at Trade Crown, where I've been there for two and a half years, and I hope that I can share some experience of what it's like to be on the more junior end and the kind of things that you can expect to be doing in the early years of your career. I was born in Hong Kong, but I grew up in New Zealand, worked there for two years before starting my career at Hoops at Three Hills as an intern, and then joined my master's in the United States and then becoming a foreign associate, again with Pivot the Three Mills in New York, before moving here to London with Three Crowns. In terms of the theme of this panel, I would emphasize two lessons that have worked for me. The first is the importance of your profile, and in particular, developing your reputation. And the second is to make the most of the weak links in your social network. So not necessarily the people that you're closest to, but friends of friends to help you grow your career. So by way of example, I got into arbitration in New Zealand when I went to an arbitration event and Professor Catherine Rogers, I had a fellowship in New Zealand. I spoke with her, she had studied at Yale and that encouraged me to also apply there where I did my masters. I well, then one time when I was visiting my family in Hong Kong, I decided to look for an arbitration opportunity and I just looked up every part, uh, about five partners and who's who legal and contacted all of them and see who had the time to speak with me. None of these firms had arbitration internships at the time, but one of them started an internship um, about a year after I contacted them. And so that's how I started my career in international arbitration and even my job here at Three Crowns, it was through a professor uh, when I was doing my master's who knew one of the, uh, the partners at Three Crowns and put me in touch. So certainly I feel like my career development in international arbitration has been due to my efforts in building my profile. So, shall we, thank you all, sorry, not, now it works. Um, thank you all for, for this introduction, and it does show that we are, even if we are from diverse backgrounds, we indeed share some things in this community, but what exactly is this community, we'll see it in a bit. Now, moving to the first part of our discussion today, we are going to see whether arbitration events are indeed that useful. Philip mentioned that there are a lot of events, and indeed there are many, many conferences, many events that one can attend. Choosing between them is one question. Um, what is their usefulness is another question. 
And I think that um, Lizzie can, can share some experience in that, um, especially coming to London from a foreign country to, to, to work in, in a boutique law firm. Lizzie? Thank you, Titan. One example I'd like to share is the Asia Arbitration drinks and dinner event that I started organizing in London here two and a half years ago. And the point is that you don't always have to wait for opportunities to come to you, but you can create them for yourself. When I first moved to London, I was looking for other people who looked like me, who were interested in doing arbitration in Asia, and I started reaching out to an organization called the Asia Pacific Forum on International Arbitration, and applied with them, where can I go to find other people who are interested in arbitration in Asia? And then discovered that this group didn't exist. And so I just started the first event, I booked a venue, and about you know, 10 to 15 people came to the first one. And just this past week, we had our sixth event uh, and with uh, over 30 to 40 people attending, and we have a mailing list of over 100. And over our past event, we have now hosted guests such as Joan Fay in QC, who is a Malaysian born barrister. We have hosted Ruth Step Fulmore of Harbour Litigation Funding. Xi'an Bao was formerly of the HKIC. I managed alcohol at, at Three Crowns here in London. And my point is that the way that you can build a profile is partly to take the initiative. This will give you the opportunity to meet other people who, have a, who share the same niche as you and to get to know a prominent practitioner in that field. Lizzie. Now, moving on to um, speaking a little bit about moot courts and one of the most uh, famous events, arbitration events directed to a more younger audience is the Bismuth that happens every year um, in Vienna. So, um, Sarah, would you provide your input on the relevance of moot courts in general? What's your experience? Whether you think they're useful? Um, had you done them, done them in the past? Um, yeah, maybe just before I turn to the root courts, just one follow up on, on what Lizzie was saying, um, because I, can, you know, I would like to echo what, the point that Lizzie was making. I had a similar experience um, when I, together with two colleagues, set up a, a group in London of German speaking arbitration practitioners, and it was you know, very similar that we just well, we, we actually just did the drinking part and <laughs> the dinner part, but, um, you know, just to set up a group that meets regularly and, you know, to exchange experiences. And you see also that people have different backgrounds and, you know, some German-speaking practitioners that studied in England. And it's just it's just a good way to get to know um, people. Um, and this group now actually um, sort of merged into this um, this 40 London group that I, that I mentioned before. So I think it's something to think about, you know, specific interests that you have or uh, specific expertise that you have and see whether there are these sort of groups that either exist already that you would want to join or that you set up yourself. Um, but going now to the actual question about the moot court, um, I have to admit that I, I didn't participate in, in the moot court as a student. Um, when I was studying, I, I vaguely knew what arbitration was, <laughs> but I was, I was not really um, focusing on that. But I have been participating in mood now in this mood and and, and pre moods and other moods as an arbitrator for uh, several years, um, and I think it's a very useful event both for students to participate, um, but also for young practitioners or practitioners to go um, to arbitrate. Um, I think for students, it's it's a good opportunity also to network with other students who are doing it, and of course also to get. You know, to get a sense or feel of what arbitration is, although I would say you know it doesn't necessarily resemble exactly what you can do in <laughs> practice afterwards. But um, still, you know, you, you you get into it and you see whether that's maybe something that might interest you later on. And also for for practitioners that then um, sit as arbitrators at these events, I think it's you know you get to know the teams, um, you get to know the coaches, um, other practitioners that sit as arbitrators. So I think it's it's great, and, and to be honest, it's also always it, always a lot of fun um, to do that. So I would, you know, I would recommend it. Although as a student, I mean, it is something to think about uh, also in terms of time. You know, going back also to what Philippe was saying, I mean, it does require um, a lot of time uh, to do that as a student and, and also as a coach. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, if, if you think you, you can do that, um, I would encourage you to participate both as a student and then also later as an arbitrator. Thank you, Sarah. I think. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and by way of example, the moot court, the VIS, is how I did get into arbitration. So participating at the moot is how I came in touch with this world and I really liked it. So I just continued my studies there and now I'm doing a PhD there. I'm actually coaching the team from the University of Cambridge. No pressure on the team, but <laughs> we, the standard is quite high this year. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, now, moving on to some um, questions. What, what are the common mistakes that um, young people um, can do uh, when participating in these events and how these um, can be avoided or should be avoided? Um, you know, as, as um, Philippe was saying before, there are a lot of events out there but now. I mean, there's a growing number. And I think you need to think about how you make use of, of that opportunity. Um, and maybe three points uh, in, in terms of mistakes. It sounds a bit dramatic. But um, one is, no, don't, don't think it's enough to just go to an event. Um, I mean, that's obviously the first step and it's, and it's good. But I think it, 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 to, to, re, to use it in a way, it requires a bit of an effort in, in a positive sense. So, you know, whether that be, you know, asking questions at the conference or, you know, then afterwards trying to get to know new people, not just mm -hmm. standing there with a colleague that you, that you, you know, anyway see every day, even, even if they are very nice colleagues, um, you know, make, make that effort um, a little bit. Second, um, don't, don't think that you always need to meet the big shots at the events, you know, like the star um, in the room. That's an advice that someone gave me um, a while back, and I think it's a, it's a very useful mm -hmm. advice. And it, it takes away a little bit this awkwardness of going to an event and just always trying to, you know, wanting to speak to this one person and trying to impress. Um, it, it is more useful in a way to network with your peers, um, because these are gonna be the people that are gonna grow with you through the ranks, and you know, who the, the fellow student or fellow junior associate one day is uh, you know, going to be a partner in a firm or it's going to be working in-house somewhere and you know, might give you, um, you know, it's going to be a, maybe a future client or someone who appoints you as an arbitrator. And I think that you know, makes it a bit more relaxed and also sometimes a bit more enjoyable because you can just basically hang out you know, <laughs> with, your, um, with your fellow um, students or associates rather than Hearing this, this awkward, um, I'm trying to impress you in the conversation. And that actually leads me to the third point. Um, you know, try to uh, relax as well a bit about these, um, this networking idea and events and, and just and enjoy it as well. Um, and not, you know, trying to oversell you constantly. Um, I think it's, it's important to also try to establish real person, personal relationships. Maybe that's a bit in, a bit in tension with the first point that I was making, but um, you know, a bit like not not I don't know how to put this, but not put too much focus on this. Oh, I now need to get to know X number of people at an event. Thank you. I'm just <clears throat> following up on what Tara just said. Going to events can be pretty daunting. <laughs> um, I remember at the beginning. I mean, I come from I'm originally from Brazil. And I think we're very lucky because if you go to an event in Brazil, I mean, the arbitration community in Brazil, we all know each other. It's very, very difficult that you're going to get there and no one is going to talk to you. So it's basically you know, a, a nice gathering of people and friends. But when I was working um, at the ICC some years ago, <laughs> not so long ago, I used to do a lot of events in Europe and it would happen that I would go to this event in which I didn't know anyone. And so during the coffee breaks, I would be the person like answering to emails and working super busy just because I didn't know what to do and I didn't know how to go and talk to people. And nowadays, whenever I see someone in that position, I do try and go and talk to that person because I know that they're not that busy. They're just trying to run away from the, you know, that working side of the coffee break. But anyways, so... Uh, Sarah also said that it's not enough to just go to an event. So is how do you effectively network at an event, an arbitration event? 
Do you really need someone to be there with you at the beginning? Do you need a sponsor? Um, can you do it by yourself? How do you do it? Thank you. I don't think you need a sponsor, and I think you can certainly go out and find opportunities. So, uh, Sarah, I also had three points prepared for this. I wonder that it's all about quality and not quantity. There are lots of events that are available, so it's helpful to think about which organizations you're interested in. So for me, I'm interested in Asia, so I was interested in joining the Asia Pacific Forum for International Arbitration. I'm also interested in gender diversity, so I joined Arbitral Women and participated in their mentoring program and tried to go along to their events. Um, so it's important to the organization. It's also too important to think about the subject matter and what you're interested in. So for example, if your niche is international investment law, you might be interested in Bickle, for example. And certainly the event that you go to don't necessarily have to be limited to international arbitration. So for example, I've recently participated in an organization called Young China Watches, which is a much larger group of people, of young people who are interested in development in, in China in a, in a more interdisciplinary fashion. And like Sarah said, I also agree that it's about developing friendships as well, instead of just meeting people superficially. And one thing that I find helpful is to take the business cards from other people and share my own, and then usually I follow up with one or two people after the event and meet them for coffee. My second point is to make the most of the connections that you already have in a way that's kind of like a sponsor. So if you're already part of Cambridge University or any other university, or if you're part of a law firm, certainly leverage the opportunities that you can get within that firm and finding out about opportunities and going along with other people as well. It's also good to sign up for mailing lists and joining Facebook groups to find out about events. And the third point is participation in groups really matters. And the more you're invested in a particular group, the more you're likely to get out of it. So one thing that I've done through my work is to assist uh, one of our partners to organize the ECHA Congress 2020 in Edinburgh, which is a lot of it is coordinating at various work streams, but it's also given me the opportunity to meet with members of the program committee on a more personal level. So those are three points um, that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, now, Philip said that there are a lot of events. How do you choose these events? And we know that all of you made the right choice, at least one, by coming here and coming tomorrow. But Philip and you, sir, uh, I, how do you choose the event? What do you, who do you target and what do, are you expecting to get from that? Philip? Yeah, that's a good question because it comes back to the point about time constraints that we were discussing earlier. There's just so many events out there. ICCDAP has events uh, every month, every week, I think, uh, Hick, Young Hika, um, you know, industry events, uh, and so on, uh, but there's only that much time, so, so how do you choose? And, you know, there's no hard and set rules here, but in, in my case, what works well is I, I, try, to, I try to have a, a strategy, you know, to just to focus on a few that you're going to engage with more than, uh, than just be, maybe a mistake would be to be a bit too diffuse and go to... Uh, to some events here and there uh, without engaging fully with them. Um, and, in, and in making that strategy, uh, one thing I've been focusing on is just groups that I'm naturally a part of. Uh, for instance, I'm, I'm Canadian, and there is a big Canadian arbitration community out there and a lot of Canadian practitioners in Europe. And there's a lot of networks, and one of them is called the Young Canadian Arbitration Practitioners, not the most original name. <laughs> but uh, they do throw in a bunch of events um, out there. Uh, actually, in two weeks, Sarah and I are on a panel that is in part organized in Paris as part of Paris Arbitration Week by the YCAP, the Young Canadian Arbitration Practitioners. Um, so I try to have a good involvement with this organization. I'm on their advocacy committee as well. and. Um, and just to have a bit of a meaningful uh, role on this one. Um, and then keep your mind open. 
you know exploit opportunities that uh, that come up that you that you necess don't necessarily have, have have targeted but that that that, that come knocking. For instance, when I was a very junior associate at White Case, uh, one of my uh, bosses was put in charge and he was the, made the editor of the ICC Institute of World Business Law newsletter. And he needed somebody to help uh, him with that uh, newsletter and uh, it fell on me. Uh, at the time it was just more work, uh, but uh, I've been helping him out with that for the last six years now. We send the newsletter uh, twice a year and um, the newsletter work itself, you know, it, is okay, but that has has opened the door to me to the ICC Institute of World Business Law, uh, and I've been going to their events and their annual conference and meeting a lot of people. Uh, this is actually a bit of a senior network. I, I think I might be the youngest mm -hmm. practitioner in the ICC Institute by about you know ten to fifteen years. Mm -hmm. but, Don't say uh, we're so old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. There's a few of us, but uh, but it is more of a, of a network mm -hmm. of, of senior practitioners, and, and that has been great exposure. And that's an opportunity that came and uh, that I you know, kept engaged with. So, so, so that was good. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Philippe. Um, Nusa, who should you target in this event? And more specifically, what I think that most people here, and especially that want to get this exposure that we'll see in the next section, how to get into a panel as a speaker. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I would say uh, it's only a couple of mouse clicks away for <laughs> each of you to get uh, uh, or become a member of any and all below 40 uh, organizations. Um, there are really a, a dozen or more of them out there right now. And uh, that gets you exactly to where um, um, Sarah and Lizzie uh, mentioned before to your peers. Uh, these are the uh, your future colleagues, and um, and they are very often, of course, affiliated to a bigger organization behind it. So ICC, yeah, for example, it's the ICC behind it. We have um, the Young ICA, it's ICA behind it. Um, on all um, um, for all other institutions that I have named, that really there are more than dozens of them. Out there, so I suggest you should become a member of that. At least that's what I always tell our people when they start um, in our firm, because that's not only how you also get to know people when you choose to get to to go to a conference, but you also see the diversity of the topics that are out there. And normally they choose always very um, novel or uh, pragmatic or um, timely topics. So you are kept on the ball what's going on in the arbitration community worldwide. Um, now, and once you have chosen them, I would I I, uh, I can um, agree with what um, um, everyone here has said on the panel as well. I'm not so sure whether I have been very um, selective. Um, it's it's really the topic that I like a lot, and I have to say the ones that I try to go definitely is again from the institutions, um, ideally at the place of the institution mm -hmm. itself. And I say that because there will be a lot more staff from the institution um, of the ICC, for example, in a Paris event than it would be somewhere outside of Paris because it just is next door. And the staff and uh, um, so the secretariat um, at the ICC court, for example, they are all very young people as well, and um, it's good to show your face already at a young a stage and young age, uh, so um, they can always fall back on you later on. Um, also, the uh, institutions they organize mood courts. Um, I think you should definitely try to um, get to them as well. But we get to that later. How to prepare for them? So once you have chosen an interesting topic uh, of a uh, conference that you want to attend to, then try to get there prepared. Don't go just with an oh, I'm gonna see what they're gonna talk about today. Just read up something. It's very easy to read up even one or two short articles on it. Just try to be a little bit prepared 
not only because it makes it easier for you to understand what the speakers would say, but also to verify what they say. And uh, then maybe in the coffee breaks to engage in intelligent conversations, not necessarily with the speakers, but with all the others in the audience. Um, so I think that's that's something that is important to um, and then who to target uh, again um, yes the your own peers and uh, uh, please don't make the mistake to go around and do some name dropping uh, that we have met this person or that person or that hot shot of this uh, uh, rising star I don't know what I don't think that comes across very um, genuine to be honest and uh, it's a lot more important actually to go to the networking events afterwards, to the cocktails, to the drinks, get some uh, people together. Shall we have a quick dinner together? Shall we go to the pub next door? And that's when you really start to glue. Uh, and that's um, where the real networking starts and how people remember you. There will be a pr practical exercise for that. Very later. good. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie, now, but how actually become, to become a speaker? And just, if, if you allow me, I will share the example of how Lizzie actually became a speaker to this panel. A common friend of ours suggested that a friend uh, wants to participate. I heard you're organizing this event. Why don't I bring you in touch? And that's how um, Lizzie came to this panel. But how do you become a speaker in, in a panel in general? Just Building on that story, the, the original friend that I met it was back in 2009 when I did a summer legal research fellowship at the Australian National University. And then I spent Christmas with that friend and met her sister. I haven't seen her since, but when she moved to London, my friend said, oh, you, you should meet with her. So I did, and I realized, I remembered that she organized last year's uh, Cambridge Arbitration Day. So then I emailed her this year and said, oh, hey, do you know any of the organizers this year? And um, this friend Alice said, yes, I know Biden. <laughs> so, and then it turned out that Biden had asked somebody at my firm to speak, and then that person was not available. Our partner was not available, and so I was lucky enough to get the spot. So the point is that these things, it is about being lucky, being at the right place at the right time, but also putting your feelers out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and some ideas that I can prepare with is, it, I'm still working on getting on the panels, and it is quite challenging when you're at the early stage of your career. I think uh, four things can help. One is being an expert on something. So, so some people have, say, corruption and in international investment treaty as their subject, and then that becomes something that they talk a lot about, or confidentiality. I do think it's quite difficult as a more junior practitioner to develop your niche because it's so early on in your career. But that's something that certainly my partners have encouraged me to think about in terms of when I'm writing an article or speaking, that it is a subject that I have thought a lot about and can bring a novel perspective on. Two is cultivate your connection and you know, make friends with everybody, it really doesn't matter whether they're in arbitration or not, as our, our story makes clear. Three, is what's worked well for me is to make the most opportunities available at my firm through teaching. So one of our partners teaches the LSE Practical Seminar of International Arbitration, and I basically just asked for a long time to get to go. And I started off having a non-speaking role, just observing the class, and I went to every class, and then the next year, the partner said, why don't you join the teaching crew? And then from then, I was invited to speak at some LSE events. And another example, one of our partners tutors at Queen Mary University of London. And initially, he said, why don't we teach together? He ended up being too busy to teach, and so he told me to just apply. So I applied for a position as a tutor at Queen Mary. And then through that, I've met students who've invited me to speak on panels. And my fourth idea is to echo what I said earlier, which is if you can't find an event to speak at, then just create your own. So you can make up a speaking role. Thank you. Lisa? Yes. 
I just wanted to add um, um, on to that as well uh, that um, so if the, the uh, if you go to an event already prepared that also gives you of course the, the chance to intercept um, uh, with a question um, because usually the events nowadays are not expectator anymore they are more like Q&A sessions as well um, and so that's the opportunity to show yourself to give yourself exposure and um, in fact I have one rule uh, at uh, in my team that I say you can go to nearly every event you want to go but only if you ask a question <laughs> <laughs> and if not money back so. <laughs> thank you um, Sarah um, still in this event theme how do you introduce yourself when you go to the event there's so many people what is your speech? How do you make people actually remember you? <laughs> well, I think it really depends completely on the you know on the event and, and on the context. I mean, I don't have you know sort of one line that I always do, so that somehow works. So, um, I think it's it's important to try to establish somehow a connection with the other person. So that's what I mean also by by context. Um, I mean, generally, I think I would put, I would mention something about my background. I mean, that I'm, I'm German qualified and I work in London. I mean, something that kind of distinguishes you from from other arbitration practitioners. Um, but I, I don't think there's like one thing that that works. But it does make sense, I think, to think about that niche a little bit, or you know, what what sort of sets you apart maybe from other practitioners, and then also use that um, in the introduction. Perfect. Sorry. Perfect. Um, now, moving to the next section, and you will all have the opportunity to indeed ask questions um, at the end, just to gather everything up. Um, now, airing your views in public and promoting your profile in public, how does this actually work? And I think Yusa will just start by elaborating shortly on this, with Philip, Lizzie, and Sarah following, and we'll have uh, the floor for some questions, um, just trying to keep everything in time as well, in my hat as a moderator and organizer, because we'll have the practical exercise of the drinks afterwards, never to forget. Um, you, sir? Um, right, so I find it very important um, to start early to um, to publish whatever it is and how short it might be. Again, there are different outlets if, uh, that you can use to um, put your thoughts together on a topic that is uh, um, general, I would say. Uh, I think uh, when you publish, for example, a Kluwer arbitration blog, uh, it's so that's my personal view. I think there are two um, mistakes one can do. Um, and one is to publish only as a summary of an event, because that would limit you um, self and exposing um, what you think about a certain topic, because it's only so many words you're supposed to use. And um, it's, it's fine, it shows that you have gone to this event, okay, but it's actually only a summary of what others have said. So rather than that, you should, um, I think, publish uh, on a topic which is general and with a longer conclusion. Um, or um, And there are plenty of cases out there that are really interesting on in anything, really, be it investment arbitration, commercial arbitration. And uh, so uh, I think that's very important. So what I have to... I have to be very careful now, walking on eggshells, um, uh, but um, I'm Iranian, so I can say that. So if I, for example, would uh, publish every, uh, um, um, every time only about something that concerns Iran or that concerns Germany or that concerns Belgium, where I live actually, um, then I might get immediately into one category mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. get out of that anymore later on. So I try to be open, and that's why I say on a general um, topic. And um, it doesn't have to be always the same uh, uh, category. So this, it's true that it's very important to f 
uh, at some stage to find a niche, but I'm not so set that you have to publish specifically always um, on that specific uh, topic or subject matter. And in terms of um, uh, uh, of uh, yeah, uh, elevating your profile, um, if you want to get into arbitration and internship, um, bank on what is different mm -hmm. with you, what sets you apart from others. Because it's a lot easier to compete with that smaller other group then the pool of everyone is interested in international arbitration. Try to think about yourself. It's a little bit of soul searching behind it, really. Try to think about yourself, where I'm from, what is, what is, what is different and what may, may have bothered you actually through all your youth or even your early student life. Uh, what is different with you, but try to turn that into something positive and say, okay, no, actually now I know because I'm really good at that because I've lived all my life with this difference, for example, whatever it is. So you maybe you hear a little bit of, um, uh, that I, uh, I, I consider myself as German, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I do not look German. You no, know, Sarah doesn't uh, look very German, but she looks more German than I do. <laughs> But I just want to say I have done it actually through my uh, um, through my youth as well, and um, and it that it has helped me um, to the extent that even um, during after my studies during my uh, traineeship in Germany, um, I was called uh, by judges to say you should become a German judge because you would set an example as a, the Iranian um, the descent to become a German judge. So and that made me think, okay, what is what is special about this? But Really, it started only then, I have to say. Um, so that this would be, for the time being, my two pens on this. <laughs> Philippe, um, we, we had what students mostly can do just to get into arbitration, but we have a lot of associates coming here. And how do you elevate your profile as a, as a young or a not so young associate? You are falling in the first category, but how do you elevate your, your profile with, as, as an associate? What is that you can do? So one way to elevate your profile is to, uh, to discuss the cases on which you're working. You're, uh, you know, when you work hard, you, uh, you meet a lot of clients and you work on a lot of interesting issues at work. Uh, but that is, of course, a very dangerous thing because um, the cases you work on uh, correspond to clients. <coughs> who in turn have often gone to arbitration because of its confidential nature. So on the one hand, you've acquired all this great experience at work, you cross-examine some very, or, or you help people cross-examine some very important people, you want to discuss about it, uh, you've encountered some very interesting issues, but, um, but there are limits to what you can disclose, whether it be on, 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 on your internet site um, of your firm, or, or even in conversations. Uh, there's a few things that you have to keep in mind as, as, as you try to portray your experience. And one of them is, are there any requirements in, in the bar rules? Mm. So for instance, in the French Paris bar rule, of, of, of which I'm a member, you can't name uh, your clients. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. And then, as I said a, a minute ago, there's the fact that a, a lot of your clients went to you because they have this dispute to adjudicate or to arbitrate uh, confidentially. So, you, you know, even if you did a great job, um, you can't really talk about it. Uh, some projects and some disputes are, are so uh, high level and, um, and, and large that even, uh, you know, mentioning their country and or industry in which uh, they are can, um, can put you in trouble with, uh, with the clients. So you really have to be you really have to be careful out there. Now, of course, if, if, if you're working on a case that is uh, public, that is in the public record, that is in public filings, mm -hmm. you know, there are some cases out there that uh, where the hearings have been uh, filmed and even mm -hmm. uh, live streamed, then of course, you know, that's, that's fair game. But you, you do have to, to keep that in mind when you uh, speak at events and uh, update uh, your website. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Um, Lizzie, how 
what is your take on coming from from abroad like almost everyone in this panel i think um how do you make your domestic skills your domestic qualification transferable to this market i speak from my experience doing a lot of interviews now for intern candidates and this may not apply to everybody who hasn't done uh, disputes before but if you have worked in disputes in your domestic jurisdiction and by the time you come to an international market like London, it's helpful to think about what you did in your home jurisdiction that is transferable to a role as a junior associate in international arbitration. So some things include, one, skills like managing large document sets, collecting documents from clients, managing large document reviews, and reviewing documents for responsiveness, it includes knowledge about document review platforms um, and experience with filings, many filings are the same, no matter uh, what the dispute is. So site checking, doing journal articles is very helpful to know what to look for. Formatting footnotes properly, knowing how to name exhibits, knowing what to look for when you're looking at defects in the exhibit before you uh, file it, uh, putting together indices, all of these skills that are universal to disputes and are very useful in international arbitration. Another point that's very, that's an important transferable skill is showing your ability to do research. Now you don't need to have you know, perfect, a perfect substantive knowledge of international arbitration. But as, a, as an intern or junior associate, you need to be able to show that you know what are the databases that are available. You know that what are the relative strengths and weaknesses of different databases. Uh, and and this, this is a question that we often ask interns to come and tell us, you know, why do you think one particular database is better than another one? And then finally, a legal acumen is very important, so demonstrating your ability to identify issues, to identify the applicable law and apply to an issue and to speak intelligently about it. It doesn't have to be on a specific case, it doesn't have to be arbitration, but you have to be able to demonstrate cogent legal analysis. If I may just jump in on one of the points that Lizzie made, which is uh, when I started looking for a position as an associate in, in, in international arbitration, I had zero experience in international arbitration. I had just finished my L1 at Cambridge, and uh, I didn't do arbitration before. I, I, was, I had a bit of a, I had done internships in, in litigation back in Montreal. So I put in my cover letter that, that said, despite the fact that I had no experience in arbitration, I thought some of my skills in litigation were transferable. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the skills that Lizzie mentioned, but also, you know, working with witnesses. Uh, it's not witness statements, it's affidavits, but it's yeah. it's similar and so on. But anyways, for the story, um, so so I send this cover letter to a bunch of um, firms in Paris, and one firm which shall remain nameless. I, I had the interview, and the first question I had was, "Why should I hire you? You have no skills in international arbitration." <laughs> uh, and then I said, "Well, this I put that in my cover letter uh, because I knew this question might come, but I, I do think I have something to bring in litigation background." Uh, it didn't work with them, but uh, <laughs> why the case really be? And maybe just add, to add up on, this, on that, I mean, not even just litigation experience, but you know, even even in other fields, um, mm -hmm, you know, yeah. it might be useful to have some background. I don't know, an M and A, for example, or company law. Um, so you know, I, I don't think it means that uh, you can't do arbitration. On the contrary, I think it can be very useful and to be honest sometimes even more useful than if someone has in-depth knowledge of arbitration yeah. I, I think Sarah again could you please touch upon the issue of the publishing your first article and how this this is actually the way to break in um, or put your your views out um, and how does does this actually help um, yeah, I mean, I think it can be one one way um, to raise your profile. Um, I don't think there's sort of you know one rule how how to do this. Um, my first publication was my my PhD actually, which had nothing to do with arbitration, and then my first arbitration related publication was actually a Kluver arbitration blog. 
Um, and I think that is maybe something to think about, uh, you know, a blog or similar format to do as your first publication, just because it is maybe a little bit less um, daunting than, than doing a whole article on something. But it also depends <coughs> on, you know, ba your background and your preferences. You know, are you actually more sort of academically inclined and that is something that interests you, then, you know, go for an article. Uh, that is you know, definitely something that, that can be useful to raise your profile. But if that's something that you're not that interested in, mm -hmm. it does take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then I would maybe focus more on doing something uh, shorter, uh, like a blog. And um, as Nusha mentioned, there are lots of formats out there, you know, blogs or, or newsletters or whatever that you could contribute. Um, and I would also echo something that was said earlier to, to, to start early with this. I mean, I don't see any reason, you know, don't, don't sit there and think, oh, I have to, you know, be an associate or, or you know, establish myself to um, voice my views on certain issues. Um, I, I don't see any reason why you can't do that, you know, early on as a, as a student, even, and you might actually have maybe more time <laughs> to do that than, than later on. Um, and in terms of the topics, my advice would maybe be not to be too ambitious. Um, you know, take something more specific, one one topic that interests you. Maybe a judgment, maybe something from your jurisdiction. Although you know, I mean, see that you don't, as Nisha said, don't sort of uh, that you're just not pigeonholed into that. this uh, one one box. But something that you you're interested in, and and don't think that you need to solve you know all the problems of the arbitration <laughs> world in in an article. Um, and then. Uh, Take it seriously as well. Even if it's just a blog or something short um, that you publish, it is something that is going to be published and it's going to stay there. Uh, so you know, put put some effort into it and and um, get it right. Um, and I, I think you could also use publications to show that you have an interest in certain areas. So when you start as an associate, you might be working on certain types of cases, and you know it might be that you're actually also interested in in something else that you you know, just don't get the chance to work on um, at the moment. And I think an, an article can be uh, one avenue to explore that and to sort of show the, uh, the arbitration world that this is something that you're actually interested in and that you have some expertise in. Thank you. Okay, so staying within the publications um, theme, so you, so you you touched upon this a little bit, and Sarah and I mentioned that you don't have to you know have a name yet to start publishing, mm -hmm. and even as you know, students, you could start uh, making your you know, first publications. But how should you? Is there a rule as to how it's the best way to go about this? Should you should you start by co-authoring, for example, articles with some other people? Uh, should you already start by yourself, or when is the point that you say I can go solo now and do my own stuff? <clears throat> I I think um, on the point of co-authoring, one has to be really careful because if you co-author with someone who is really well known, that article will always be associated to that really well known person rather than being co-author shipped by you and that person. So I don't say necessarily don't if that opportunity comes up because it's an amazing opportunity, but just manage your own expectations. Um, it is different if you would, uh, if you would publish or co-author with someone who is like an our age range, I would say, um, because um, um, or you know a, a young young partner even, but it doesn't have to be a senior partner. That's my point. So a younger partner, a senior associate, counsel, something mm -hmm. like this, because then your name will actually be equal to the other person's name. It's a little bit unfair, but this is unfortunately how publications go. If you have publications by very big names, then everyone assumes that anyway, the research is done by someone else. And uh, it's actually very nice um, of that big name to mention you at all. Uh, and things have changed, thankfully. So um, at my time, that was really not the case that you would even get a mention or an asterisk. Uh, but I think uh, um, the publisher, the authors have become a little bit more wary about that. And um, so they are um, now taking their um, juniors more seriously. 
but um, when to go solo? So I, it's really difficult. Um, definitely on the shorter articles that we talk about, um, do them alone. So write them alone, the, the, the blogs and etc. Um, but also, if there is a really interesting modern Euro generation topic, take it and take ownership of it. Technology, digitalization, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, smart contracts, um, whatever it is, you know, um, social media, etc., etc. So everything that you are actually an expert in, because that's a that's a uh, an area that is not very tapped it's untapped also by others um, um, who are uh, a long more a longer time around in the arbitration world already um, or you will see new developments as well um, on arbitration on um, uh, on the um, auto orphan and space um, or for example um, on art it's very interesting as well so these are all the topics that are really untapped yet. So there's a whole world out there. But um, um, also, but very, very important, it does stay, it doesn't go away. And one of the things that uh, law firms are looking at, first and foremost, if they want to hire someone, is re research skills and drafting skills. Mm. I'm not sure which one I should give a priority, to be honest. I think as a student, it was, of course, research skills. Not sure. Because at the end of the day, it's the drafting that counts. It's the drafting of the um, written submission. It's the drafting of a procedural order. It's the drafting of the, um, of the witness statement or helping the witness to draft that or the expert, etc. So it's, it's the written word that is really, really important. And once you have... Um, you have your topic, now we, whether it's co-authored or solo, you really have to make an effort that it is extremely well researched and um, that it is well written as well. So uh, in, that's, that's one of the main things. I mean, that's what, why you went to law school for, just to learn that as well, if you hadn't um, um, yet... Uh, 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 that's over. If the skill hasn't come out yet, but really drafting skills are so important. Um, and so I am not. That's why I say it depends really on the topic. I don't say don't go solo at the beginning. No, because I have read really amazing, well thought through, in depth articles on topics by very young person, by LLM students as well. Um, and uh, these are articles that. You know, one goes back always to um, when they want to do, a, when someone wants to look up um, a certain subject matter. Thank you, Nisha. Um, now, moving slightly again back to in the firm, on being already an associate, are there any touchy subjects that someone who should avoid actually touching that can elevate or knock your profile in public, fill it, and then Lisa, if you can just tip in and elevate actually your profile within the firm. Yeah, I don't think there's any taboo topics sure. that you should avoid out there. I think um, as you go on and, and publish, though, one thing you should be mindful of is the fact that whatever opinion you're putting out there it's uh, will stay. You, know, you can't erase anything from the internet. Uh, so you have your name next to an opinion, but then you don't know what your next case is going to be. And maybe the position you will have to advocate in your next case is contrary to uh, whatever opinion you put in an article earlier. For, just to give a, a basic example, maybe if you feel strongly about lost profits in international arbitration and you write a very beautiful and convincing article that uh, they should not be awarded um, because you feel strongly about that, but then on your next case, uh, the interest of your client requires that you make a lost profit claim uh, and maybe you're in charge of it and um, so you make the arguments you need in the case and then inevitably what you'll see and i'm sure we've all seen it in this table is the other side will put in your former article <laughs> as an exhibit um, uh, you know to point a contradiction in your legal thinking now if you're before experienced arbitrators uh, you know they know that these things happen you know is the fact that you, the current position you're advocating is contrary to your position on record on an article, is that going to make or break the case? Probably not. 
but it will be embarrassing and you will have to contradict yourself in your legal pleadings. Um, so you have to think about that. Maybe some ways to address that is to make sure when you write articles to, uh, to air out both sides of, of, of whatever argument and to be very careful and just ask yourself the question, you know, if this became an exhibit in a case where I had to adopt a contrary position, how would I get out of it? We often talk about raising our profile externally, but raising your profile internally is very important as well. My first thought is think about your internal clients. So these could be people both senior to you and below you in rank. It's important to respect everybody. But build the quality of your work and your hard work and attitude is probably the best profile that you can build for yourself. And if you work hard within your firm, you'll get opportunities within, within that too. The second point is thinking about opportunities to raise your profile within your firm. So at my firm, we have firm-wide meetings where associates have the opportunity to give a short presentation. And this is a good opportunity to make yourself known not just to your colleagues in your office, but also colleagues in other offices. Also take advantage of team meetings, particularly with partners, it's very helpful. So if you can take ownership of a particular part of your case, you can come prepared to a meeting to offer your ideas. My third suggestion is, again, to take ownership of particular parts of the case. And what you can do as a junior associate is really to get your hands dirty into the trenches in, say, document production. It's one of the least glamorous part of international arbitration and the most painstaking, so nobody wants to go there. But if you are willing to be on top of it, then you're the, going to be the main person liaising with the client. And there are many issues in international arbitration, issues of strategy that turn on disclosure of documents and the rules about withholding so this is an opportunity to raise your profile internally with your team but also with the clients of your firm in particular my final point is that as a junior associate it's important to be aware of both your billable and your non-billable commitments so the advice that i got was always that like your billable work should be your priority and then it comes back to a question of time that the big friend Sarah talked about is, you know, the time you could be spending doing other things, maybe the time that you're doing your non verbal work, when you're writing articles, when you're, you know, writing comments on new rules or going to arbitration events. So those are my suggestions for improving your profile within your firm. If I could just take in on what uh, Lisa just said, never underestimate the task that is given to you. She just mentioned our document review, and that's extremely important because if you are the person that knows all the documents in the case, you suddenly become indispensable. Your partners need you, the senior associates need you, everyone will look you know, after you because you are the person who knows and can find the document quickly at a hearing. You know, the documents uh, that are in the case, and I was mentioning to them that I'm just back from a hearing on a case that's been going on for 10 years now. The amount of documents in this case is just unimaginable. Uh, and we had at least two people, because all well, we had to divide into two, <laughs> that knows the documents. So whenever one, you know, someone mentions a document at the hearing, you need to find the document very quickly, bring it to the partner and tell the partner what the point is about if you know the documents, you become indispensable. So never under, I mean, it's not the most glamorous task, but never underestimate any task that is given to you. Uh, but now moving on to um, a related topic. Uh, and as I mentioned, we are all from, you know, foreign backgrounds are on the table, and I suspect that a lot of you must be as well. So for a, a foreign uh, qualified lawyer studying in the UK, uh, and that's a question that goes to Sarah and Lisi. How do you um, how do you present your profile in the London market? And then if Philip could just you know tip in with what's your view of the Paris market, and then we would go straight to 
Nisha in giving her in giving us some tips on how to you know best present one's profile during um, an interview, for example. So um, when you present yourself, maybe you know, starting with when you would, for example, apply um, somewhere, um, I think it's it's important to keep in mind that your background is not really necessarily familiar to the person or to the firm where you're applying. So just make sure that you translate a little bit your, your experiences so that it makes sense for the other person. For example, in Germany, you have this legal training where you have two years um, where you work for a judge and public prosecutor and so on. And that's something that um, the, the English are not necessarily familiar with. They When they think about training, they think about something different. So if you put in your application or your CV, you somehow need to explain that. and. Um, you know, you can use it also to your advantage because it's actually, you know, it's actually a lot of experience that you've gained that um, English qualified lawyers might not necessarily have in the same way. So they might think, oh, this is something newly qualified, but it might actually mean something slightly different than an English qualified lawyer. So just make sure that you, you know, you help basically the other side understand what your experience is and, and translate that um, for them. Um, and then I think a lot goes back to what we've been saying before about your niche and, and your background that you, you know, when you present yourself on the market that um, people are aware of that, that you are an expert in that, you know, in that field or have that background in a jurisdiction. I think it's also important to keep contacts with your home jurisdiction as well. I mean, you are here on, you know, on a particular market, but to, to keep these contacts um, home um, as well. Um, and also think about of positioning your yourself a little bit more broadly that you don't end up only in this niche um, and and i mean that in two ways first for example as a german qualified lawyer that you have a transferable skill because it's a civil jurisdiction so actually you know if you know german law um you don't know <laughs> all civil laws but you know there the, the, the are a lot of concepts that are very similar and you can have a conversation with a civil lawyer in a case um a lot more easily if you have that background um, and more easily than, than maybe a common law trained um, colleague. Um, and secondly, also think, um, this is not really transferring your skills, but I think if you are somewhere else, I think it's worth considering qualifying in that jurisdiction as well. I mean, there, there are pros and cons and, you know, it also depends on what your future plans are. But um, I mean, I qualified here as well and I did find it useful um, to have that background as well. I mean, after all, that is you know, sort of the main jurisdiction that I'm now based in, and, and I think it is then useful uh, to have that to have that background. Especially well. taking into account Brexit as well now. <laughs> well, <laughs> could have a whole <laughs> other panel on that. <laughs> Maybe that goes on the topics that one shouldn't <laughs> discuss. That, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Easy. I just have three points to add about how to make the most out of your master's. One is take the opportunity to write. So I did my LLM paper on third party funding and international arbitration, and that was a great subject when I was interviewing for associate positions. Two is it's great to do things outside of arbitration. The one thing, one really fun thing I did during my master's was a, what was called the hearing officer project, where we did, we arbitrated some very simple disputes at the, with the local department of consumer affairs. And I think that was interesting for the interview that I conducted. And third, you know, really make friends with the people that you're doing, uh, that you make in your masters, their lifelong friendship. And in fact, my, my friend from um, LLM is here tonight and he doesn't even do arbitration. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, enjoy your masters and it will really pay off. Uh, just a quick word on Paris. Uh, I mean, the, the, this, the arbitration scene in, in Paris is uh, is very international. There, it's uh, of course there are some uh, some French practitioners of, of arbitration. There's a fair amount of them, but there's just a lot of expats, uh, Canadians, Australians, Lebanese, uh, you know, you, you name it, uh, in Paris. So it is not very hard, I find, as an expat to uh, to, to to fit in. Um, uh, at my firm, for instance, we have uh, a very diverse team with a lot of nationalities. And then, um, you know, Paris is a jurisdiction where there's a lot of events. The ICC is there. There's cocktails every week. There's Paris Arbitration Week, uh, early April. So, um, so really, you have no excuse if you uh, don't do the events. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, to the que um, the question about uh, what can you do, how to display your profile um, before or during an interview. I think it's very important, and it might be a full-time job, in fact, um, to try to find uh, a rapport with a person you are going to be in contact with at the law firm. Forget about HR. My advice is, sorry about that, write directly to the lawyers. Skip HR. Um, because <laughs> the lawyers, they know what cases are going on right now and whether, oh, maybe oh, that's an interesting profile. Maybe we can put that person actually on that case right now where we definitely need someone from that jurisdiction. HR wouldn't know this. And uh, so really, I uh, emphasize this again, and I have done it myself also successfully, um, uh, to apply directly to the partners of the firm. But, and that's where I come back to the full-time job, it means that you have to find the common ground between you and that person um, that you are going to contact. And it might be really very, very, very remote. Uh, so you have to uh, do a whole uh, profiling of that person, which cases a person has worked on, and see where do we meet. Um, I even went so far in my earlier days to maybe emphasize something on my CV that I was sending to that person, but de-emphasize it when I was going to send my CV to another person. So I'm not going to, I didn't do anything wrong with my CV. The CV was always the same thing. But in terms of what were my tasks uh, during that uh, internship, I would emphasize maybe one task and de-emphasize another one, depending on who was the addressee of that CV and that ap application. Um, so try to find this report um, and um, then um, uh, what I do, uh, no matter from which university uh, applicants are coming from, really in this kind of thing, I always ask for a writing sample, the latest one. And I get a lot of surprises, I have to admit. Um, so also from students from very good universities. Uh, and um, so don't be intimidated. You're already at a very good place, don't worry. But uh, don't get intimidated by uh, peers who are at other uh, universities that you think, oh, you will never reach that. I come from Cologne University, no one knows about it. It's a good university, we have a great uh, program, but it worked as well. I don't know, Sarah, you uh, you also did the Cologne uh, uh, French uh, dual no, one? The Munich. Uh, the Munich, yeah. No, Munich is uh, supposed to be a better university than Cologne as well. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, but in Germany, I mean, that's one thing, but yeah. it doesn't really matter no. that much. I mean, so. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But um, so um, the other point is show flexibility. Um, sorry, no, to go back, I also ask for writing samples. So again, we go back to the fir uh, previous topic, start to write, but write in a very well manner, write in a really good way. Um, and because that's something that we will also check. Um, then uh, show flexibility, and with that I mean um, uh, in any in any regard, show flexibility, because that's what it comes down to once you get into the job. Um, if you say no, sorry, on Tuesdays I always um, um, uh, promised my boyfriend to cook, and that's why I have to leave at five o'clock because I have to do the shopping from the fresh market still doesn't come across very well already if you start as an intern, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it, it sounds a bit harsh, but uh, welcome to a real life. And you know this from all the late nighters that you have here at the university. It will continue as well, maybe. Um, until you get uh, maybe uh, at a stage where you can delegate a little bit more. But uh, still, this will never leave you. So yeah, it's, but you, if you have the passion for the, for the work, then you do it anyway with great pleasure. Um, then um, the hands-on experience, show that on your CV. Uh, uh, and with hands-on experience or with a street smartness experience maybe, what I mean is that um, do show that you have worked, what Lissy for example has done already, um, and the, the smaller arbitrations for consumers uh, or uh, even in NGOs, whatever kind of experience you have. One of our star arbitration uh, associates, I would say, she actually worked um, at an NGO in Cairo um, uh, for immigration. So that means that 
African immigrants coming to Cairo wanting to go mm -hmm. to Europe. I mean, that's tough. That's tough work, but it also showed that she is a tough girl. And um, then she went into data protection law, and with that experience applied to our firm. She's Australian, by the way, as well. <laughs> and um, so, uh, uh, but she impressed us so much already that we said, sure. And she said one thing that I later on talked to her about again. She said in her interview, you will not be disappointed. And I'm like, this, this is really uh, impressive that you have the guts to say that. Uh, and I said that to her. I said, really? She said, yes. <laughs> so um, I, a year later, I said, you remember, Emily, when you told me you will not be disappointed? Yeah, we're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And um, just to give you the point that don't be shy, be self-confident. Uh, really be self-confident in what you have done and you have achieved so much already anyway so you have to I mean it sounds like a prep talk now but really you have to really <laughs> believe in yourself as well otherwise how are you going to convince the other side on the table that you are the right person to hire um, one thing only um, as an experience so I um, after my law studies so after university, first aid examination in Germany, I had to wait for my traineeship because it was very um, it was very uh, um, crowded. Everyone, uh, we had to wait for about three months. So I wanted to do an internship, and I was completely set on Buenos Aires, always my dream place to go. And it actually uh, coincided with the crisis in Argentina. So I got a lot of um, uh, no's from law firms. Um, and then an opportunity came up in New York in a law firm where I work still to this date, I would say, on one of the most amazing and interesting cases I've ever worked on. And that was on a, a so-called Holocaust case uh, because we were at that time in a phase where the German government and uh, German industry set up a fund to reimburse um, former slave laborers in Nazi camps. So they needed a German lawyer to understand how this works with German law, administrative law, etc. I had no clue, but I had already a public international law uh, background and um, that was very important as well. And I did then um, do that internship. That internship, one and a half years later, helped me to get to Wilmer, where I did my other internship because uh, Wilma Hale was also working on the case. And I put that on my Again, as I said, I did the, the research uh, and the profiling and I put that on my CV also because I was very proud of that experience. But um, that's how I got into arbitration, through that um, report that I tried to find and also uh, through that internship. So you never know what brings you to the next step as well. And that's the other thing as well. Don't be afraid if you first go into one direction and then realize, no, that's actually not what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to do something else. Perfect. Thank you, Nisa. Picking up exactly from the point of profiling and making the connections and jumping to the exact next section of our and final uh, section of our discussion now, a way to do your research and to find these connections nowadays are social media. And in the professional relationships, LinkedIn, for example, is one of the prime sources to find information or directly to connect. And I'll, I'll just invite Philip, Lizzie, Sarah, just to give their experience and give their um, opinions on how these social media actually help you or not and whether not having that such connections or such social media is a detrimental or something that holds you back Flip? yeah so linkedin uh, is not the most exciting social media we can all agree on that but um, i think it is useful uh, most of your fellow practitioners um, uh, are there. Uh, so it's a good way to keep tab on, on what everybody's doing and, and where the market is going. Um, I use it to post relevant articles and, you know, just as a way, a, a minor way, but but a way to, to, to increase my profile and, you know, people are, are, are seeing what I'm doing. Um, one thing that is very uh, helpful for practitioners is that uh, headhunters are very active on LinkedIn. It's scary sometimes. You get contacted with people you don't know at all and they, they have insight about a position here and there. 
but uh, it, it is useful. I find it useful even if I'm very happy where I am to uh, to know. Uh, it, it gets you a feel for the market. So you know who's hiring, what conditions are offered here and there, and, and that's just something that you could seek out separately. But you know it, it comes to you kind of free and uh, without any effort on LinkedIn. So it's that, that's quite useful. Um, I do think it is useful for students as well. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I recommend you you create one. Uh, and start populating it. Uh, when I was doing my LLM, through an old connection that I hadn't really kept in touch with, but I, that I had on my LinkedIn, I received a job offer from a firm in Canada, um, which was a bit out of the blue, but it, you know that's always nice to receive. Uh, so once again, limited effort, but um, you know potential benefits. Um, so do use it. Anything? One use I had for LinkedIn was when I was looking for my first job. So I, I worked for an employer who said, I'm happy to connect you with people that I know. Tell me who you want me to connect you to. So I went on her LinkedIn profile, looked at all of her connections. And that was a, that's a really helpful way to identify specific people that you want to have your application forwarded to. And as Bruce said, it's quite helpful to contact partners directly and one of the best ways to do that is to get somebody who knows your work well and who's willing to vouch for you to then forge application to other people that they know. Um, yeah, so I'm actually not on LinkedIn, but maybe I'll change my <laughs> change that after this event. And to be honest, there's no particular reason um, for that. Um, maybe I'm like generally a little bit careful of what the information I put out there, but I mean LinkedIn is of course perfectly fine. Um, and I think nowadays it is it is really the standard and, and what people do. I mean, maybe one one thing to consider is just to, uh, I think it has to complement other things, you know, mm -hmm. it works in tandem with other, with other things. So just to think, oh, I have this LinkedIn profile and I have, you know, however many um, uh, contacts and it's it's all great. I think, you know, you have, you have to still have that personal contact um, with people. but. You know, if you do then LinkedIn in, in addition and, and use it in a smart way, um, then, you know, I think it, it can be useful. And it's certainly, you know, it is becoming the standard. And of course, when we need information about someone, um, you know, LinkedIn is also where, where we look. Okay, actually, I have another, yes. another thought that occurred to me was uh, while Sarah was speaking, which is uh, I've used LinkedIn a fair bit uh, as exhibits in, in cases when you want to establish that person X is working for company Y uh, and so on. So you do also have to be careful. I, I've, it's been a bit of a, of a theme in my interventions tonight, but, um, but you know, any, anything you put out there, you have to think uh, what can uh, be made out of it. And then another point I wanted to make is that um, I receive a lot of random LinkedIn Attention. connections yes. for people that I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you can tell through the common connections, you know, that that person tries to enter into the international arbitration scene and and, and that's fine. But sometimes you have no idea. And, uh, and, and that is a downside of LinkedIn, which is you, you, there's just a lot of random out there. Picking up directly from your first point, that leads us to what you said will just uh, discuss now on how these connections, how what you post out there on LinkedIn, or even your like or your um, congratulations, the almost the automated messages that LinkedIn has. Um, how does this affect from an arbitrator's or a counsel's perspective in a real life case? Um, indeed, the the key motto is use it in a smart way. And I second what Philip just said as well. You have to be really careful because um, it's there are cases out there where um, where I, I first start from the other one. That what I see on LinkedIn is um, sometimes that some partner from a law firm would say, "We just secured this victory in that and that case, and um, here this is the this is the decision of uh, that court um, in an annulment proceeding or an ad hoc uh, um, um, committee at the exit um, proceeding." And then what you see as well, and that's why I really get curious: <clears throat> thirty-five likes. And maybe four comments. So I'm like, okay, what does it mean now? You say the 45, whatever number I 
that I said I forgot again. Uh, um, I'll see you in a moment. But uh, so the 35 likes, they, each of them, they say, great, well done, uh, lawyer uh, Mark Smith, uh, that you have won this case. But it also means, well done, that you won against the other law firm and against the other party. Um, and the comments, congratulations, uh, uh, Mary, and congratulations, um, Sophie, or whoever is a lawyer there in charge as well, um, that also has the effect of the reverse, that it means bad luck for the other one, and I endorse this win. So from an arbitrator's perspective, now I don't want to be too paranoid about it, but one could actually spin it further, like people like Philip would do the research then, in order to challenge an arbitrator in another case, maybe, or myself as well, to be honest, um, uh, then to see, okay, so in that case, this arbitrator, this person has like that law firm so in the next case where that law firm was also a party or was appointing that party um we could maybe make a case of bias mm, towards that party you have to be really careful what happened in real life as well so uh is that um, um uh, arbitrators um sorry that the losing party has tried to set aside uh, an award on the basis of a Facebook connection. So Facebook yeah. is a little bit different. Facebook in my uh, world, and I stepped out of Facebook already back in 2008, so I was there for two years or something, and I stepped out of it. Um, uh, Facebook is really more personal. Whereas LinkedIn is supposed to be, and that's how they market it, it's 100% professional. Um, and if uh, in that specific case, um, there was a, an award challenge that uh, uh, on the basis of the presiding arbitrator um, uh, being actually uh, made a, a, a president of the bar um, and the party, the council, sorry, of the winning party liked that result, supported that person in the campaign of being, becoming the president of the bar and so the losing party and said there you go there was already a bias um, uh, on facebook first of all they were connected they were friends and uh, second uh, there was already bias now it didn't go through in the end um, it was the first the award was set aside indeed by a lower court and then it's, it's, it happened in france and the supreme court then said um, no uh, remanded again to uh, the court of appeal um, this is not um, there is no reason given by the court of appeal um, why it was actually set aside. And there are other cases out there for judges as well. And in x it's in Germany that one judge has um, um, overstepped completely um, his role. Uh, I can get to that at the drinks later on. But it's just to give you an example and to give you the um, real threat that's out there on LinkedIn uh, in terms of arbitrators as well. And then another point is that um, use it smartly. Please do not post every day or every second day or even once a week something on, on um, LinkedIn because then people don't even look at it anymore because you're posting, you're over posting basically. How much do you have to tell anyways? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa. And although we are slightly behind in the schedule, I think that we can open the floor to a couple of questions and then, of course, all of us will be available at the drinks reception uh, outside um, for questions or to interact or ask whatever you want. Any questions from the floor? Okay. One, two, okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, here. No, no. Thank you. This field is very competitive and practiced by only a few international law firms. I was speaking to one QC. And he said to me uh, in a light mood that it is a small mafia. So what is your advice for those uh, people who specialize in this area early on, academically, but cannot get into one of the very few law firms, but still they want to uh, practice in this field? So what's your advice for those? Uh, so, yeah. Should we take the other question as well? And then so then we can... so, 
first of all, thank you to all the panelists for the very interesting insight. And I was just thinking what something that Maria Claudia said at the beginning, what in Brazil, everybody within the arbitration community knows each other, and it was very different in Europe. So my question was, to what extent can we talk about European arbitration community as opposed to a Paris arbitration community, a London arbitration community, a Brussels arbitration community? And when you, for instance, work, say, in the Paris office of a local in an arbitration practice, how much exposure do you get or should you get to the arbitration world in London or Brussels or Stockholm, et cetera? Thank you. Can I just give one practical tip? Yeah. Um, following what just happened. Whenever you then ask a question at an event, say your start name. by <laughs> stating your name. Yes. Because you know, we're all here and it's a good opportunity yeah. for you to say who you are and for that people start remembering yeah. who you are. So yeah, I think that's tip number one. Just start by stating <laughs> your name. Yeah, over that. Um, thank you very much, panel, for this great, great, inspiring talk. My name is Karen. Right now, I'm doing my GDL at University of Law. And to elaborate a little bit, GDL is a one-year law program that is established in the UK. So instead of three years, you can achieve a bachelor level in one year. So my question is related to like future studies, because if I got this correctly, like all of you at least have an LLM and Sarah got a PhD as well. So I'm just wondering to what extent having an LLM has helped you in your career. Thank you. I think we can start answering to stay. <clears throat> what about you? About the first Happy question. To start with yeah. the third one. Oh, the third one. Yes, um, of course. Uh, just because it's closer to my mind. Uh, for me, I would say having an LLM was a, a tremendous benefit. I came to Europe as a Canadian. You know what, what, dis what distinguishes me? I, you know, I, I know law. I know Canadian law, but studying at Cambridge gave me an international touch, which then I think uh, opened the doors. Um, but so I didn't do my LLM in arbitration. And I think now what we're seeing in the, in, in the field is that uh, a lot more people are specializing in arbitration at the moment. Maybe this ties into the first question as well. Uh, a lot more people are specializing in arbitration um, through their studies than, than they used to. And certainly it is an asset to do so. Uh, I don't do recruiting of interns so much, but Misha, you do. And, I, and I'm sure that when you see uh, intern candidates or associate candidates that come in and that know all about arbitration already, it's useful, but I do think there is still one way to enter the industry, which is maybe what, what I did, just coming out, c c coming into it w without any arbitration knowledge as just uh, as a practitioner. But maybe that second way is becoming a bit uh, smaller now. Thank you. Lizzie? What I would add to that is the field of arbitration is becoming more and more competitive. And so we're, seeing, we're simply seeing more and more qualified candidates who, who often have LLMs. So it's not crucial, but it's definitely very helpful. Another point why it's helpful is because it can help to equalize the playing field, like fairly or unfairly. Sometimes it's very difficult to understand an academic transcript of universities that you're not familiar with. So having an LLM from a reputable university can help like interviewers to better understand your performance relative to other candidates. Nusa, what about the first question and the, if you can use this one. Yeah. Sure. Um, so what I, uh, the, what, if I may, only the third question, yes, I'm course. the only one who doesn't have a postgrad, <laughs> but I made it as well somehow, I sneak my way through. Um, but, uh, and we, that's because, and I have really the highest respect for Sarah, that's because in Germany you study until you die dead, basically. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I, I studied for nine years and I was one of the quick ones. I, it's a nine year because I went one year to Spain, to Barcelona to study there, but uh, I had it. But I do have to admit, coming from Germany, 
uh, I did consider getting a PhD, and so that's how I started as well. I had my PhD uh, um, already a subject matter line and laid down, um, but then I started working at the same time. I said, "No, forget about it." <laughs> and um, and so and I, it was in England. I think it would have been different if I would have started in Germany. I probably would have pursued the PhD, but because I was working in um, in London, I uh, left it where it was, uh, and um, so. But it's true. The specialized LLMs, definitely, we also look at them. Um, it's an add-on, I would say. And uh, anyways, my motto is always, I should always hire someone who's smarter than I am. And even better if that person has the specialty already um, um, from the student um, time. Then on the first question, indeed. So um, what to do if you're not able to get into the few um, law firms or the, the, the arbitration um, a bubble that's out there it's it's really a tough question to answer and i don't have the perfect answer for that but what i would say is that um one should if you're really interested in that you should continue um reading up on it to see what's going on and still again also try to publish because you never know what an opportunity comes up in a couple of months or next year or whatever and then in the meantime try to uh, nonetheless get work experience in um, whichever field it is, whether it is arbitration or not. I gave you the, the example of one of our uh, associates and uh, it's really, um, uh, it's really, it, it, it is a tough market, it's true, um, but it shouldn't uh, still uh, uh, make you think that you will never get into it if you're not making it into this field right now. You have still time, and but use this time then very, um, very wisely, and um, stay in touch with the arbitration community. Stay in touch with the uh, with the topics, um, but get work experience now. You don't have to become an associate. You can also get long-term internships nowadays. It's the internships are not only for two months or three months. Um, law firms are happy to give six-month um, internships as well. Um, try and try and try again. And in any event, you can always, as I said, get in still through another way. Data protection is now also a big thing right now. Mm -hmm. And if you would be an expert in data protection, maybe through data protection, you can get into arbitration or there are different niches as well. Corporate law, I mean, um, really, there are different, um, different practice areas that are all connected to arbitration because arbitration at the end of the day, it's only a way of procedure. procedure. The sorry. European, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry, a few things on this second yeah. question and we can wrap up afterwards. Yeah, on the, on the second question, I mean, I do, I, I do think there's a European arbitration community in a sense, and I think there are then sort of just sort of groups <laughs> in, in Paris and, and London. So, I mean, there's some events maybe in Paris, for example, where you wouldn't necessarily have uh, people mm -hmm. coming from other European cities, but then you have events um, where, you know, it's, it's a sort of European event. So, I, I, I do think there's a European arbitration community um, that is, you know, distinct maybe from an Asian arbitration community or a South American arbitration community where people know each other mm -hmm. and, you know, go, go to events together. Um, so, you know, if, if you are in one place, I mean, I think it, it makes sense to not just stick to that place, but, you know, broaden your horizon a little bit, at least to, to the continent <laughs> that you are um, practicing in. Thank you. And sorry, I'll just use this mic. And I, first of all, I would like to thank our speakers, and I think we should do it in the traditional way of thanking. <laughs>